This is Duke University. I am Neil Siegel. I teach constitutional law and co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, the program is honored to mark the passage of 10 years since the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. And we gather today to reflect on the evolution over the past decade of the law governing what has widely and controversially been called the War on Terror. Joining me are Professors Curtis Bradley, General Charles Dunlap, and Professor Mary Dujak. Professor Bradley is the Richard Horvitz Professor of Law and Professor of Public Policy Studies here at Duke. He teaches and writes extensively in the areas of international law, foreign relations law, and federal courts. He also co-directs Duke Law School's Center for International Comparative Law. General Dunlap is the Executive Director of Duke Law School Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. He's the former Deputy Judge Advocate General of the U.S. Air Force. He retired from the Air Force in June of 2010 as a Major General after 34 years in the Judge Advocate Corps. His teaching and writing focus on national security, international law, civil military relations, cyber war, and military justice. Professor, and he's a legend in his own mind, believe me. <laughs> and your mom's as well, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dijak is visiting Duke Law School this semester from the University of Southern California, uh, where she is the Edward J. and Rui L. Guirado Professor of Law History and Political Science. And Professor Dujak is a legal historian whose work centers on international approaches to legal history and the impact of war on American democracy. Our panelists will speak in the order in which I have introduced them, and I will add some words of my own when they are through. Professor Bradley. Uh, thank you, Neil, and thanks, everyone, uh, for coming. Um, since I'm the first speaker, what I thought I would do is help uh, try to frame our discussion a little bit uh, by commenting on several features that I think are, um, are at least potentially surprising as we look back during the last decade, at least surprising compared to what one might have predicted and some people did predict uh, shortly after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and the three features that I want to highlight um, are first the political branch consensus and to some extent also judicial consensus in support of using a war model, at least in part, for addressing uh, terrorism. Uh, second, uh, that what I will describe is a fairly high degree of continuity between the Bush administration and the Obama administration with respect to the legal issues in the so-called war on terrorism and then finally, um, the extensive involvement of the judiciary in uh, managing the legal regime governing the war on terror. So the first surprise, at least potential surprise, is the extent to which we are now uh, see um, a very high degree of consensus between Congress and the executive branch and between the political parties on using a war model to address uh, terrorism. Uh, so we see, for example, that the uh, executive branch and Congress have both supported uh, Obviously, the use of force, military force against members of al-Qaeda uh, and associated groups, and also the ability to detain them in military uh, custody and try them in military courts. Um, it is potentially a surprising development, given how controversial this idea has been and certainly was in the early days after 9-11 among illegal academics writing on the topic, many of whom insisted that only a criminal justice model was appropriate. Um, Congress, I should note, has not specifically regulated the topic of military detention, but it has enacted a very broad use of force statute that is still in place that is uh, targeted at al-Qaeda, among other entities. And it has not expressed any disagreement with the Supreme Court's interpretation of that statute as including a detention authority. It's also enacted two comprehensive statutes authorizing the use of military trials for alleged terrorists. Now, in terms of the judiciary, I want to be a little bit more hesitant about that because the Supreme Court, um, those who have studied cases in the area know this, um, has not yet expressly endorsed the war model outside of the context of battlefield fighting in Afghanistan. Um, but we would also have to know the court has had a number of other cases that I'm sure some of the other panelists will probably mention um, addressing uh, individuals connected to the war on terror. And in none of those cases has the court even hinted that it would repudiate the war model adopted by the political branches. And in fact, in the 2008 decision of Boumediene against Bush, the Supreme Court actually expressly delegated to the lower federal courts the a task of developing a common law of habeas corpus that would regulate the specifics of this war model, and again, not in any way suggesting the model itself, 
uh, should be abandoned. And in fact, the lower courts in the D.C. Circuit have done exactly that, both Republican and Democratic appointed judges, by the way, all accepting the war model and attempting to fill it in. A second potential surprise um, is the continuity, and a related surprise, obviously, um, of the continuity between the Bush and Obama administrations on these legal issues. Uh, somewhat surprising, particularly if one takes account of some of the rhetoric in the last presidential campaign, in which Obama um, suggested stark differences between himself and uh, President Bush with respect to these very issues. So we see, for example, the Obama administration has, like the Bush administration, uh, repeatedly in court supported a power of indefinite military detention of individuals connected to al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces, regardless of whether they're captured on the traditional battlefield. It has also supported the legality of military commission trials and, in fact, is starting uh, with, after some initial reluctance to use uh, that very process. And it has further uh, resisted, just like the Bush administration, any extension of habeas corpus rights uh, to uh, the other detention facilities not yet addressed by the courts, most notably in Afghanistan. And I would note, and probably many of you have read about it in the newspapers, in at least one respect, the Obama administration has been more aggressive than the predecessor administration in using the war model, and that is, of course, its increased use of targeted killing of alleged terrorists, most notably through predator drone attacks in a variety of countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, but also several others. There are some differences, and I won't have time to cover them, uh, between the two administrations in their legal approaches, but many of them are cosmetic, and I think not a significant uh, difference. The one that I think is uh, a, an appreciable difference, but, but some people I think overstate it, is on the approach to issues of interrogation, uh, most notably issues relating to torture or methods that might approach torture. And the Obama administration has quite explicitly disavowed uh, such techniques, uh, including waterboarding, but other, other forms of so-called enhanced interrogation. So this is an important change, but it's important to know where we were at by the time President Obama took office, which is that the United States, not obviously just because of the Bush administration's own decisions, but also because of court decisions and congressional enactments, had moved largely to where Obama is already at now. So Congress had already prohibited in 2005 coercive uh, treatment in the Detainee Treatment Act. The Supreme Court in Hamdan the uh, next year uh, said that a provision in international law and the Geneva Conventions applied, which further limits coercive interrogation. And we now know that waterboarding was stopped well before uh, those um, developments and that most of the enhanced interrogation techniques had also been abandoned by the time President Obama took office. Um, so with that partial exception of interrogation policy, um, I find a very high degree of continuity between the two administrations, and again, at least to some people's eyes, probably surprising. A final uh, potential surprise as I look back in the last 10 years is the extensive uh, involvement of the judiciary and at least being available to manage the legal regime of the war on terror. And if you go back and read a lot of the articles that were written right after 9-11, but certainly also before, more generally about war, you find many and perhaps most scholars saying courts simply don't play much of a role during wartime. They're completely deferential to the executive branch. They find uh, consistently reasons to abstain, so they relev often don't intervene at all. Now, the Youngstown steel seizure case, uh, perhaps the one exception that pro proves the rule during the Korean War. But most people say the paradigm is the infamous Korematsu decision during World War II when uh, the court upheld, uh, very controversially, uh, the exclusion of Japanese Americans from the West Coast, showing in many people's eyes this strong deference to the war policy of the executive. Since 9-11, and I won't go into detail because I know other people on this panel probably will, but we find many, a number of major cases by the Supreme Court in which they do intervene on the war on terror, exercise jurisdiction, and often hold against the executive branch, um, including the Boumediene case I've mentioned in which they uh, not only exercise jurisdiction over Guantanamo, but delegate to the lower courts uh, broad powers to regulate uh, the substantive issues there. Um, having said that, the Supreme Court has left many issues open, um, including precisely who can be detained in the war on terror and the allowable uh, length of detention, but uh, at, their, at the Supreme Court's direction, the lower courts in D.C. have in fact filled in those issues, and interestingly, often have been willing to order the release of detainees, particularly in the district court uh, level. So 
To sum up, uh, in looking back at the legal landscape as it has developed in the last 10 years, uh, I find uh, three potentially surprising developments. I think all, by the way, one can explain, and I w uh, maybe when the question and answer period uh, can offer some of those explanations. But they're the political uh, branch and, to some extent, a judicial consensus in favor of the appropriateness of a war model, uh, the high degree of continuity and the legal framework between the, particularly the second term of the Bush administration and the current uh, Obama administration, and the extensive uh, involvement of the courts in managing uh, the legal framework. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Bradley. We'll hear now from General Dunlap, who will discuss the rise of lawfare in military operations, as well as the use of drones. I, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Neil. And uh, Kurt, I, I'm in violent agreement with everything I understood about your. <laughs> Hopefully not too violent. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about very briefly, because I really would like to get to the Q&A, because a lot of times that's, that's the more interesting thing for all concerned. I want to talk about something, as Neil mentioned, lawfare. And from the context of how is the, the law within the armed forces, how has the view of the law changed since 9-11? And I think it's been pretty dramatic. You know, it's always been in the military you would get some legal training in terms of the law of armed conflict, meaning the forces in general. But since 9-11, it's gotten very dramatic for a number of reasons. Dunlap's view is it has a lot to do with globalization. If you look at the history of warfare, whatever has happened in the commercial sector tends to bleed over into, con into the way wars are fought. Globalization has spurred the rise of international law because you need international forums, you need accepted principles and so forth to have commerce. And that has, and once that consciousness has been raised, then people are going to start looking for other opportunities on how to use law. In terms of conflict, I call lawfare the strategy of using or misusing law as a substitute for traditional military means. And let me give you an example. The beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom, which was the Afghanistan operation, there were companies out there who were selling imagery. They take a picture, a satellite image of our base, and it was three meter resolution. So you could see the fighting positions, you could see the, the, the fence line and so forth. And a number of different ideas were put forth about how we were going to deal with that. And there are tradi more traditional military means that we could have used to stop that information from getting to the bad guys. But instead, a legal weapon was deployed called a contract. And we bought up all of that commercial imagery. We spent about $22 million to buy up that commercial imagery. But it had the same effect as if we had used traditional military means. Um, the reestablishment of the rule of law has become a central tenet of our counterinsurgency strategy. If you look at General Petraeus's book, there's a whole chapter in there about rule of law and how it's essential. The, the reason being, and Senator Lindsey Graham, who's a reserve military lawyer and who had been a student of mine years ago, not a very good one, I might add. <laughs> He's done well since then. But um, he said, you know, there's more than one way to kill an insurgency. And part of it is you reestablish the rule of law to give people confidence in the government and willingness to, to support it. But the most common use of lawfare, I would have to say, is by our adversaries. And this has a lot to do with trying to uh, present what we're doing as somehow illegal or immoral. And Bill Eckhart, who a colleague of mine, he's a Vietnam veteran, had tried some of the, uh, tried the My Lai massacre case during the Vietnam War. He said that, you know, he, he really, uh, in a law review article in the Chicago Law Review, he talks about how the adversary is exploiting our, the way we're fighting and trying to allege that it's immoral or illegal. And I agree with him. And it's bad enough when the enemy manufactures those incidents, but it's even worse when there's a true incident to exploit. It is a sad irony that the biggest defeat the United States has suffered since 9-11 was not by force of arms. Not a single American soldier directly died as a result of this defeat. But it had the most catastrophic effect of anything, and it was Abu Ghraib. General Petraeus will tell you today that Abu Ghraib and the, the, everything that came out about the detainee abuse had a, he says it's non-biodegradable. 
that means even today it is brought up by people in the Middle East. And I think it's something that is even affecting the American psyche because there was a, there was a poll just this last August that was generally supportive of a lot of things that the United States is doing. This is a poll of Americans. But 41% of Americans said that they were ashamed of the image that fighting the war in terrorism has given the United States and the rest of the world. I thought that was kind of interesting. But we've also seen another phenomenon. When people try to improve upon the law, and NATO is a good example in Afghanistan. In 2007, after there was an airstrike and some civilians were killed, NATO came out and said, you know, if I want to get these words right. If we knew there were civilians nearby, we wouldn't drop a bomb. Okay, thought balloon here. What do you think the enemy starts thinking when he hears that? And a year later, NATO said, um, and I'm, I'm quoting here, if there's a likelihood of even one civilian casualty, we won't bomb not even if we think Osama bin Laden is down there. So what has that done? The law doesn't require that. The law re requires the proportionality analysis so that casualties shouldn't be excessive. But when you start trying to, these well-meant, I will assume, efforts to improve upon the law, you actually cause more civilian casualties. And an example of that is when General McChrystal went in and he put all these additional restrictions on airstrikes. Okay, that was in June of 2009. What do you think the numbers showed by 2010, June of 2010? Yes, the number of civilian casualties by airstrikes went down. But guess what? The overall number of civilian casualties went up by 31%. And the number of NATO troops killed reached an all-time high. And it's not hard to figure this out. Because the adversary, once he knows that he's not going to be subject to this, he has a lot more freedom of movement, and he lives to kill more innocent civilians. And it's ironic. And one of the things that we have to do as lawyers, you know, you've got to get into the documents. Because just about a month ago, uh, the UN came out with their study of civilian casualties in Afghanistan, and the headline was, Airstrikes Leading Cause. Okay, what you draw from that, that, my God, I guess airstrikes killed more people than anything else. And then, uh, that's why you have to get into the documents. The number of civilians killed by airstrikes was 5%. So 95% of the Afghan civilians were killed by something else. 80% of them were killed by the enemy. And the rest... The ones that were killed by the NATO forces, when you look, they divided up. They didn't, if, if you were at, in a convoy, that was one category. If you were in ground combat, that was another. So they had five different, four, three different categories for ground, ground surface fires. And so they, it's very misleading, and it leaves people with the wrong impression of what it takes. And then that drives these other kinds of policies that end up with 31% increase in civilian casualties. So my, I think one of the lessons that we draw here, and I'm going to end after this week, we can take up drones in the Q&A if you want. We have to, as lawyers, we have to get into the facts. We have to understand the technology. Because I can tell you that the young lawyers who are out there today in those command centers, the, the law part is the easy part. It's understanding the technology, the tactics, the weapons, and everything else. It's your ability to apply the law to the facts. And if you don't understand what the facts are, you're not going to be a successful national security lawyer. Now, one last thing, and then I really am going to shut up. There was another poll, and this is really troubling. It was a poll conducted by the American Red Cross last April. It's on the web. You can, you can check me out on this. And it found, not too surprisingly, that four or five uh, youth never heard of the Geneva Conventions. Not too surprising. But it also found that 59% of the youth believed in torture. You ought to be able to torture suspected terrorists. And 51% of the adults thought that. Uh, that was bad. And then a, another... 50-some, a majority, 51% said, you ought to be able to torture uh, 
you know, enemies who you capture if they've been doing bad things to American servicemen. This is the level of knowledge. But the really shocking thing to me, and I was showing this to <laughs> Professor Bradley, because you, you can, seriously, Kurt, don't you agree? You can't believe it when you, when you read it, but for the fact that I brought my source documents with me. 41% of the youth think it's acceptable for the enemy to torture, capture American soldiers. What in the world is going on? And 30% of adults think that. So what I'm suggesting is that there's a lot of ignorance, not just of the law, but the why behind the law. And that's what you have to school yourself into, being able to answer the question, not just what the law is, but why is the law that way? And so you don't have these dumb policies coming out like NATO did in 2006 and 2007 that end up getting real people killed. Thank you, General Dunlap. Now Professor Dujak will talk about post-9-11 legal thought, specifically what she calls wartime thinking and sloppy causality. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, and I'm apologies if we have PowerPoint issues. I'll just sort of throw the remote in the audience and, and go on. Uh, but it's, I'm, I'm so happy to come after General Dunlap because I think that on some level, in different ways, we have a similar message. Uh, thinking about the impact, uh, the, you know, when you said you have to look at the documents, it just made my heart, you know, thing. And, you know, and, and including the I issue of... I'm an historian. <laughs> I live to make your heart sing. So. But, you know, as a historian, I also have to say both Professor Bradley and General Dunlap are basically primary sources for me. Um, and so what, what I want to do is, is basically step back a little bit and think about, you know, how are we thinking about this era um, as a moment in U.S. legal and intellectual and diplomatic history? Um, what are some of the problems? And I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Um, so. Uh, the, the issue of the impact of, of war on American law and politics is a version of the basic impact of law, uh, uh, the relationship between law and society question. Now, law and society scholars um, have to interrogate both sides of the binary, right? We have to closely interrogate the law, and we also have to closely interrogate the social changes or social conditions that we might argue are driving American law. So uh, what tends to happen in constitutional scholarship on the impact of war on rights in American history is legal scholars are really good at doing the law part, closely interrogating the legal story, but they tend to take war as a given. Um, for example, citing each other for the nature of the Cold War, legal scholars citing other constitutional scholars, as opposed to citing scholars of military or diplomatic history. And what results from that is sometimes the war that's figuring in legal discussions is different than the war that's being discussed, the characteristics, even the date range of the war that's being discussed by military historians and diplomatic historians. It's at least true historically, and I suspect it's true now as well. So I want to, so, so this is a work of political science, um, Adam Berinsky, uh, War and Public Opinion, uh, who just simply makes the point that, if I make one point, this is it. We can't take war as a given. We have to interrogate it just as closely as we interrogate our legal precedents. So I've got sort of three points to cover, and I'll probably skip over point two. Uh, one, to think about the concept of wartime, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll make sure to try to get to the end how it is that law and lawyers come to play a particular role now um, so that I think diplomatic historians, I tell the graduate students, you won't be able to write about this era if you don't learn about law. Um, and I think for legal scholars, legal historians, they won't be able to understand this era unless they can get a sense of the kind of fusion of law and security that happens during this time period. Okay, so th th there's a set of ideas that we're coming out of that sort of inform our thinking about law and war before we get to 9-11, and that's that essentially there's two kinds of time, wartime and peacetime, and history consists of moving from one kind of time to another, right? And then across the time zones is the swinging pendulum, 
rights in peacetime, security in wartime, et cetera. Moving from one time to the next causes the pendulum to start swinging in another direction. There's lots of arguments about what does the pendulum really do, blah, blah, blah. But you know, this is usually sort of part of the architecture of our thinking um, before we get to 9-11. Um, and so built into this is an assumption that war is temporary. Right? It's always followed by peacetime. So when we enter a wartime, we've by definition entered an era that comes to an end. And that helps to facilitate a number of things, the most important of which is you know, that wartime essentially becomes an argument. Why do this? It's wartime. What does that mean? It's at least two things. It's really important because the security of the nation is at stake. But also, it's temporary. Don't worry about it. We're going to stop doing this after a while. Um, and basically what happens post 9-11, whoops, the wartime is supposed to be crossed out. Uh, so basically what happens is scholars argue about what is this? Uh, is this a war? Is this a crisis? And there's a lot of law review articles taking that up. Um, but basically what happens is there's a new language for this exceptional kind of time. Um, but the, the regular uh, temporal structure remains in place. So people call it something else. Sometimes they went back and even revised old papers so that wartime in the past became crisis time, so that a past crisis time would be a model to think about the current crisis, which we're not calling a war now. So we have to rethink American history as crisis times. But, but what happens is this basic temporal structure remains in place so that American history is imagined as a passage from you know, normal time it, uh, is, is periodically ruptured and then restored. Again, wartime being something temporary. So this is an example of the, the war times that commonly are thought about, written about, in works on war, the impact of war on rights. For example, Jeffrey Stone's important book, Perilous Times, Free Speech, and Wartime, only he ends the Cold War in 1957, at least his consideration of it. For Cass Sunstein, it's 1958. You know, but basically, these are the wars, regardless of how they're, they're temporalized. So let me just give you another way of thinking about it. Um, I decided to look at US military campaign service medals, which is basically the US government deciding, we're going to give a soldier a medal for service under fire in an American military conflict. If we look at those, it looks like this. Um, OK, and so basically what you see is uh, American forces deployed many places, many times. Um, and it's hard to think about American history the way Jeff Stone talks about it in Perilous Times. He says 80% of our nation's history is peacetime. Only 20% is in wartime. It's during these war times that we essentially screw up First Amendment rights, and then we have to fix it. Uh, and so wars are lessons for the next exceptional moment that comes along. So um, basically, one of the things that I think we have to do in thinking both about how to understand the past, but how to understand the past as having lessons for our current era, is to sort of step back and actually look at What's been the experience of American war? Um, and I think that uh, you, know, you could come up with other sequential arguments about times that matter. But, but I think our, our current um, uh, framework tends not to work. Um, now, it's in part because of the fluidity and persistence of um, contemporary military conflict, that it hasn't been easy uh, to bind it in time, that we get unsuccessful efforts on the part of precedents to basically shove war in time to sort of call, call, it, call an end to it. And so one example, of course, is the mission accomplished moment. But we had another one, um, right? You may not have remembered this, but there was supposedly uh, an end of conflict in Iraq uh, in, in August 19, uh, 2010. It was a media moment between NBC News and the Obama administration, followed by a speech um, that where, where uh, President Obama said conflict in Iraq is over. This immediately created a problem uh, because, sold, and, and, and here was the sort of pull out of Iraq um, and the end of the conflict. So soldiers then said, well, wait a minute. I'm still serving in Iraq. Do I, am I eligible for hostile fire pay? Uh, do I get my, do I get a medal for this? And so the Army came back quickly and said, well, combat, um, uh, uh, combat has ended, but combat conditions persist. 
Um, and so uh, uh, Thomas Rick said, rarely uh, do, are, are, is the government so clear that the emperor has no clothes clothes, but they had to do something because soldiers really care about medals. Um, now I'm going to skip past beginning of the war, how it's framed, and a curious aspect of post-9-11 thought that legal scholars started uh, wrapping themselves around a Nazi political theorist Carl Schmitt. And, and there's one reason for this, because his most, of, most often quoted statement, the sovereign is he who declares the exception, just seemed to fit. Uh, the two things happen uh, post 9-11. Not only does the president declare that it's a wartime, you know, framing an era uh, successfully, ultimately, that then drives American politics from thereafter, but he essentially became the sovereign by so declaring, uh, in that, remember, this was a, a weak president after a disputed election. And really, it was his, his framing this as a wartime that helped enable him to rally successfully, largely, rally the nation behind him so that he truly became the nation's president, as opposed to a president whose very election was disputed, which he had been not long before. Uh, anyway, but there's a, this is the, uh, cites to Schmidt in legal scholarship. That, uh, so I will, um, and I just want to say uh, that this, this argument tends to cause us to see everything as being so overdetermined, you know, that once the sovereign is sort of on a roll, uh, there's, there's this inevitable expansion of executive power, and I think we're starting to see in post-9-11 political theory uh, a, a pushback uh, and an argument that, wait a minute, uh, even in moments of crisis where the executive plays a strong role, uh, there is a role for politics. Um, and I have examples I can talk about later. But so law and lawyers, so your importance, essentially. Um, and um, uh, Jack Goldsmith, who was director of OLC for part of the Bush administration, um, his book, The Terror Presidency, I think is a really helpful examination of, you know, of, of how law was working um, during the post-9-11 years. Um, and he talks about um, uh, basically decision-making turning in many ways on questions of law. Um, so that uh, since, it, since you needed to do whatever you could, you couldn't step back unless there was a good reason, he says. And so a lawyer's argument that, it's, that it violates the law, especially the criminal law, that was a good enough reason. So essentially the boundaries of executive action, he argues, uh, were set by law, not set by political considerations, not set by diplomatic, uh, di di diplomatic questions in international relations, um, not even set by military strategy, or morality, right? The, the, the law, he argues, comes to bound uh, uh, administrative decision making. Um, Martin Flaherty pushes back from my interpretation of Goldsmith, uh, wanting to see law, human rights law, really sort of playing a, 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 a role as opposed to uh, law becoming a, a terrain that enables um, decision making in a way that, um, that, uh, that closes out um, other kinds of considerations like humanity. Um, now, there are different ways of framing the question of, of lawfare, and General Dunlap's um, is tremendously um, clear and useful and helpful to me, um, where, where he's, he, in an important essay, calls uh, law a weapon of war. Uh, it's lawfare when it's used to achieve a military objective. And, and he basically argues that law is a way of bringing humanitarian concerns essentially into the battlefield, into strategic decision making. But there's an, another model that really seems to resonate with Goldsmith's formulation of how decision making happened. So I think these conceptions of lawfare work together. Um, are, are sort of in, the, um, in our thinking about law and war together. Um, and that's what comes out, I think, of David Kennedy of Law and War, where he essentially, I think, carves out law as a space of decision making. He said that's what's happened, both on the battlefield, where we've got essentially JAG lawyers helping to call the shots. You can do this, you can't do that. Right, so that law is, is, is infused into the battlefield, um, perhaps as a way of bringing humanitarianism in, 
But Kennedy says displacing other ways of making decisions, including simply thinking about, is it a good thing to kill this person? Is it a good thing to refrain? Um, so, so Kennedy basically sees uh, law as a decisional space, um, blocking out other forms of judgment. And the 9-11 director, um, uh, commission director, Philip Ziegler, talks about it exactly the same way, uh, that, that lawyers end up framing the decisions uh, blocking out considerations of foreign affairs, politics, and, and other things. Um, and so, uh, so this, I think, is, uh, is a conundrum going forward, um, that we're likely to see a fusion of law and security um, going forward. Um, and just back to my original point, in order to understand this era, whether you're interested in domestic civil rights, whether you're interested in international law, um, whether you're interested in executive power, we have to take into account the kind of fusion of law and war um, that happens in the post-9-11 era and think seriously about how lawfare works, either as the sort of tool uh, that can be um, useful militarily or legally, as, as uh, General Dunlap uh, describes it, uh, or do we have an environment that D David Kennedy um, uh, uh, um, Con is concerned about law basically taking up the space, becoming a terrain of decision, so that it's law that's setting the boundaries of our action, and not the broader set of human uh, concerns, conditions, and norms uh, that we might think should be part of policy making. All right, thank you very much, Professor Dujak. What I'd like to do uh, with my time is focus on what I know best, which is uh, the decision making of the Supreme Court of the United States since the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And specifically, I want to identify one key way in which the court's performance in terrorism cases is very similar, very much reflective of the functioning of the late Rehnquist and early Roberts courts during the same time period in other areas of constitutional law. And then I want to identify an illuminating way in which the court's performance in terrorism cases is not particularly reflective of the court's functioning in many other areas of constitutional law over the past decade. So first, how are the court's terrorism decisions like the court's performance more generally? Well, the court's decided six major terrorism cases since 9-11. Uh, they've involved the habeas corpus rights of citizens or non-citizens. Um, for the most part in these cases, the executive branch was either detaining citizens or non-citizens as so-called enemy combatants without access to federal court review of the legality of their detentions, or else the executive was attempting to prosecute detainees and military commissions for alleged violations of the laws of war. Uh, six cases, in each of the six, Ju Justice Anthony Kennedy is in the majority. And you might not think that's that big a deal, it's only six cases. Well, it turns out that Justice Kennedy is the only justice who's in the majority in all six cases. Um, so what does this reveal? Uh, I think it reveals what we know about uh, the late Rehnquist Court, especially the early Roberts Court, which is that the court is a they, not an it. Uh, it's composed of nine highly opinionated, methodologically and ideologically diverse lawyers uh, on such a court uh, the median justice prevails much more often than not, and over the past decade, Justice Kennedy has been the median justice more often than any other justice. Uh, I say that because uh, Justice O'Connor right, is no longer, uh, no longer on the court. I think she was, while the time she was there, uh, arguably more often the median, although they, they split, that, uh, they split that, that, that characteristic very much of the time. What this means is that the, the Supreme Court's terrorism jurisprudence is Justice Kennedy's terrorism jurisprudence. And I think these decisions reflect at least four features of the ways in which he responds to constitutional cases. Uh, first, these decisions reflect his legal pragmatism, uh, by which I mean his concern about the consequences of judicial decision making for the country and for the court itself as an institution, his preference for standards that accommodate conflicting values over rules that provide clear guidance but sacrifice certain values to others. I think secondly, these decisions reflect his moral idealism, by which I mean his very strong sense of fairness to the individual of justice. Uh, third, I think these opinions reflect his sensitivity to public opinion 
as well, uh, more broadly as uh, world opinion. And finally, I think these, these opinions reflect what I think some of you have already experienced in law school, which is uh, Justice Kennedy's sometimes creativity in distinguishing precedents and statutes that uh, at least appear to interfere with the vindication of these other commitments. So I think uh, the Supreme Court is the Kennedy Court in terrorism cases as well as in uh, Supreme Court constitutional cases more broadly. All right, second, how are these terrorism decisions uh, unlike the court's performance more generally? Well, if you remember a case uh, you may have forgotten from long ago in 2000 called Bush against Gore, uh, uh, the court that decided Bush against Gore was and remains a self-confident and assertive court, regardless of what you think about the outcome of that case. And judging from the polling data uh, that's been available since that time, including very recently, the court has good reason to be self-confident about its general capacity to secure compliance with its decisions. The court is substantially more popular than the other branches of the political branches of the national government. Nonetheless, in the specific area of terrorism, what I want to suggest is that the court's role has been palpably and self-consciously modest. It has not been all that aggressive all that assertive. Think about all the legal and political controversies related to terrorism since 9-11 uh, that the Supreme Court has had and will have absolutely nothing to say about. Um, as, as for what the court has had something to say about, certain, certain uh, uh, characterizations, generalizations are appropriate. Um, for one thing, it's not said all that much. It's been assertive in declaring that federal courts possess statutory or constitutional jurisdiction to entertain habeas uh, petitions brought by detainees. It's been somewhat assertive in insisting on greater procedural protections for detainees, uh, better ways of making sure that the detainee is who the government says the detainee is. But the court has not offered extensive guidance about what those procedural rights entail. As Professor Bradley mentioned, uh, they've, they've uh, deferred that issue to lower federal courts. And on top of that, the court has rejected or avoided, sometimes on very questionable grounds, the few claims of substantive rights that have come before it. Uh, the court has not offered much guidance in this area as well. I think the single most important example Professor Bradley mentioned in passing, I want to focus on it. I think it's the single most important substantive question regarding the authority of the executive branch to indefinitely detain alleged terrorists. Who qualifies as a so-called enemy combatant subject to indefinite detention without prosecution for a crime. What's the outer limit on this legal category? In other words, even if a detainee is given all the procedural rights in the world, greater than exists in an Article III federal court, can the government detain the individual? For example, if someone gives money to what they think is a charitable organization, but it ends up turning out to be a funding source for al-Qaeda, can that person be detained as an enemy combatant? In Hamdi versus Rumsfeld back in 2004, the court defined the category of enemy combatant very narrowly for purposes of deciding the case. An enemy combatant who's detainable as part of a supporting forces hostile to the US or coalition partners in Afghanistan and who engage in armed conflict against the US there. The court left for another day the definition of enemy combatant in its fullest form, whether the definition was any broader. And seven years later, it's still leaving that question for another day, notwithstanding subsequent opportunities to flesh out the meaning, notwithstanding the Bush administration's very broad definition of enemy combatant, which a Bush administration lawyer said in court would cover the charity hypothetical that I just mentioned. The little old lady in Switzerland could be detained as an enemy combatant. And notwithstanding the Obama administration's somewhat less broad, but still broad definition of who can be detained as an enemy combatant. Why is this? Right? Why is the court had something to say, but not as much as in many other areas of constitutional law where it's quite confident about its ability to decide controversial cases? Why has it, in essence, jealously protected its jurisdiction to entertain habeas petitions only so that it can decline to say much once it, once it entertains them? Uh, I think there are a variety of explanations for this. Uh, I want to mention two ways in which the specific context of national security and terrorism uh, might be importantly different from other constitutional settings in which the court routinely intervenes more aggressively. First, I think the court doesn't 
particularly trust the executive branch. And by the court, I mean five justices, including Justice Kennedy. And I think they don't particularly trust the executive branch for good historical and theoretical reasons. Historically, the executive branch has amassed a track record of being either dis dis disingenuous or mendacious to the court. Uh, Karamatsu is a prominent example in which the Solicitor General of the United States outright lied to the court about the threat that Japanese Americans pose to the national security. Several members of the current court have not forgotten this. Theoretically, um, I think Justice Souter said it well in Hamdi, the branch responsible for security is going to overvalue security and undervalue liberty when the two conflict. Right? It's not hard to predict this, and we've seen this in practice. And so I think uh, the court retains jurisdiction so that it can restrain the executive and Congress to some extent, even when it does not rule broadly on the merits for the time being. The court retains discretion to intervene if and when it thinks the political branches have gone too far. At the same time, and here's my last point, I don't think the court particularly trusts itself either. I think the court is acutely aware that it lacks much relevant information, it lacks relevant expertise about how to protect the nation when it faces a threat of terrorism. Uh, it fears that the stakes are sufficiently high, that overvaluing liberty, undervaluing security, right, uh, when generals, judges do this, uh, that the consequences of a mistake can be deadly. And so it ends up deciding momentous cases narrowly, leaving many questions undecided. Let's stop there. We've got four minutes to go. I'm sure we can get 15 or 20 questions in. Yes? A question for General Dunlap. How instructive uh, has the Soviet experience, specifically with like the legal norms observed and not observed in Afghanistan, been for this concept of lawfare? As it applies to America. Experiences, yeah. that we said, not instructive at all. Well, actually, wrong. Who's uh, wrong? It is instructive because it's instructive of the, what not to do. And the thing I want to emphasize about lawfare is that it's not just law for law's sake or because it's the right thing to do or it's the moral thing. It's very pragmatic. In the modern world, you can't conduct operations if the world if your own constituency doesn't support it. And a lot of that in a democracy has to do with doing things the right way. So the Soviet style in Afghanistan, I think, was counterproductive to their strategic interest as well as their tactical interest in terms of winning the hearts and minds, so to speak, of, of Afghans. So in other words, adherence to the rule of law is a very, very pragmatic Thing. And in this respect, I will take issue with uh, David Kennedy's view that somehow law is occupying space and pushing other things out. I didn't see that. In fact, it was the lawyers who were bringing in the other kinds of considerations. And why is that? What does, two, what does Rule 2.1 in the Model Code of Professional Responsibility, who knows this? 2.1 in the Model Code of Professional the role of the lawyer as a counselor. And it says the lawyer may inform, you know, use uh, moral, ethical, political, economic matters which help the client's uh, situation. And that's exactly what you bring to the table. And a lot of times, lawyers have a better view of that than other people. So in other words, so the, the bottom line is, I think it's very instructive in a negative, it's a negative learning experience. It shows you what not to do if you want to win. Okay, one last question. Yes. Uh, my question is for General Dunlap, but sir, you, you, talked, you talked about uh, the requirement to look at the materials to apply the law to the facts, which I, of course, agree with. But can you comment on the challenge for either national security lawyers domestically or legal officers internationally to apply? in some ways an antiquated law, if I can use that term, in an asymmetrical, in a symmetrical conflict to this new asymmetrical world and the, the chasm that Yeah, I'm, I'm in a universe of people that says that when you really study the existing law of war, it is applicable and it can be adapted to the modern condition, but you really have to get into it. The practical issue associated with it, for example, and this goes to something Mary said, Everybody says, drones, oh, God, they're a new thing, you know, we don't know anything about it, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, you know, excuse me, but how did David kill Goliath? 
how did the English bowmen kill the flower of French knighthood at Agincourt? How did Alexander the Great defeat, with his 16-foot spears, defeat everyone else who had 12-foot spears? It's, so the concept is the same. You're killing before the adversary can bring his weapons to bear. But you have to unpack factually and as well as the law and go back to, well, why is the law this? It's all about answering the question why. Why is the law this way? What is the law trying to do? For example, you know, on this, this issue, should we try people in civilian courts or, or military? What do you want to drive the adversary to do? He wants to be tried in a civilian court. Do you, is that good, is that good to encourage people not to have uniforms and, and, and to do, so when you unpack the law that way and look at the why, you come up with the answers. But you've got to be able to get, just to foot stomp it, you've got to be able to get into the material and understand the facts because you're going to be talking to people who are under extreme stress. And, and I know you you know what I'm talking about, Steve, and that what you tell them, they're going to make it, somebody's going to get killed based on what you tell them. That's why you have to be fully prepared for those moments. And don't think because you're only 25 years old, that's like, you know, well, I'll call up the general and ask him what he thinks. Uh -uh. You're going to be making that decision right then and there. And that's why it's so important to get into the materials. Well, I'm pleased that I called up the general for this panel. I thank all of the panelists for participating, and I thank you for being here as well. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.